Welcome to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth podcast with your host, Chris Durow. Years ago, Chris was a firefighter and a paramedic and witnessed many people not getting another tomorrow, and it shaped who he is now as a financial strategist. Chris doesn't just help people plan for a secure tomorrow, he helps them plan for a better today. Chris lives and works in Burlington, Ontario, and runs an advisory practice named Three Hats Financial. Let's get to it. And this is The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth with Chris DeRow of Three Hats Financial. We're so glad you're back. I'm Patrice Sikora. You have put creativity, sweat, worries, and energy into creating and growing your business. But now you're thinking, maybe it's time to reap the rewards and sell. What should you do before putting up that for sale sign? Well, Chris's guest, Ryan Parkinson, is here to suggest a few things. Ryan is a senior manager with Grant Thornton, who began his career in commercial banking and who has assisted businesses with leadership services. He even did a stint as the CFO for a mid-sized brewing company. Now, Chris, I'm curious to hear Ryan's advice for those business owners who are ready to move on, as well as advice for prospective buyers. Thanks, Patrice. Well, thanks, Ryan, for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Uh, for my listeners, Ryan has helped us over the last couple of years, as well as some clients in regards to b- buying and selling businesses, and has quite a bit of experience, as you'll find out on the show today, doing this. So we thought it would be great to have him on the show and give us some insight. So Ryan, since COVID has hit, I've been being asked more than usual from clients about selling their businesses. COVID's obviously changed many things for many people. And some of these business owners are now rethinking their exit plan on either to do it now because of the changing circumstances or obviously hold off longer than they had planned because they kind of want to wait things out and see how this all settles down. So my first question, I guess, Ryan, would be recently, have you seen more businesses changing hands right now in this COVID world or are people mostly sitting back and kind of waiting to see what happens? Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for having me. So when we look at the the business environment right now, we have a bit of a catalyst to create future events. And for the last 10 years or so, we've been talking a lot in the mergers and acquisition and buy and sell community about the aging population and how there should be more businesses for sale. And what's happened in Canada and specifically in Ontario is that that hadn't been the case until now. And what we're hearing from our client base and throughout the market is businesses that were once ready or not ready to be be sold, sorry, are, are ready. And they're ready because they're not interested or, or they've worked hard enough to get their business where it is and to go through this inflection point in an economic cycle and completely change how they're doing business may not be something that they're willing to put the time and energy into. So we're seeing quite a bit of that, not necessarily businesses that have said, put me up for sale today, but I want to explore the opportunities of selling my business. The flip side is, is that a lot of the businesses that were in the sale process over the last year and may have started before COVID hit, they've, they've held off. And that has a lot to do with the value that is being attributed to the business and frankly, the uncertainty. And from the buyer's perspective, it's the same as the seller. The buyer is very concerned about getting into a business when they don't know what the economic future holds, both at a macro level, but also for that individual business. And it's typically the same reason why the sellers are eager to put their businesses up for sale today. Okay. And then you and I have had chats over the last couple of years that there's even before this, that there is an overwhelming number of business owners in Canada that were, that need to be getting ready to start selling just because of the aging demographics. And we've had chats about this before and all the steps that they need to get ready to start doing. Now, my first question then would be on average, how long before someone starts thinking about this, should they be getting everything organized? Because you and I both know that it's not as simple as and you just mentioned there. You're not just going to wake up one night and decide that you're going to sell that week. 
So we know like for business owners, this whole exiting their business should be a process, not necessarily an event. And how long should they start preparing in advance for this? Yeah, Chris, that is a you know, fairly complicated question because it, it touches on f- uh, a few aspects of, of a business. And, and I think the first one is, is that business set up from a, a tax and legal perspective to, to sell? And if it's not, the answer can be up to two to, to three years to actually get a structure in place where it's advantageous for that seller from an after-tax cash proceed basis. And what I mean by that is there's a few structures within the Canadian system that allow for owners to defer and in some cases forego paying capital gains tax on their investment. Um, At the end of the day, the business is an asset and the, the asset is going to yield the return for that individual. And really what we're looking at is, well, how do we optimize how much cash is in their genes at the end of the day. So the first piece is, well, are you structured from a tax perspective? And that could take up to two years. In conjunction with that, it's no different than selling any other asset. If you think about selling a house, you're not going to go to an agent on a Thursday and say, I want to list my house on a Friday. Chances are there's going to have to be a lot of legwork that goes into it. You're going to take pictures, you're going to clean up, you're going to finish some renovations, and you're going to, you know, for lack of better terms, put some lipstick on the pig. (laughs) And the same thing happens in in the business community, where we're optimizing that business from various aspects, where we're looking at customers and we're looking at suppliers, we're looking at lease agreements, we're looking at financial statements, a big one that's come up recently with clients that are looking to sell and sell rather quickly is what are your financial and internal operations and controls and something like inventory it's very challenging for a business that doesn't do proper inventory compliance counts checks on a regular basis to go and sell their business because they can't verify some key financial figures when the time comes so you know, back to the the question of how long, it's really dependent on the situation. But the more time you you give yourself, and if you can give yourself up to two years, it's going to be better for that seller in the long run, because there are uh, several factors and several complicated transactions and, and cleanup work that has to occur before you can even take it to market. And that's a good rule of thumb because, of course, there's so many different businesses and they're set up in so many different ways that the two-year mark on average is a good rule of thumb then to kind of try and follow. So let's. Then, I, I did have a question about financial statements. So you just touched on that and let's let's jump to that for a second. So to maximize the value of a business, obviously, these business owners want to put that business in the best position and the best light they can. So having these financial statements organized that would obviously help maximize the value that they're going to get in the potential eye of a buyer, correct? And what can they do to start getting that organized? Yeah, and and I think it's, again, to to simplify things, you go back to some other asset transactions that people are familiar with. And it's not common practice when you go and sell a house to provide a buyer with a home inspection report. But just think about the the assurance that you're providing those potential buyers if on the the first table when they walk in is a copy of that inspection report. Mm -hmm. It gives that buyer a different feeling and and a different perspective as to who they're dealing with from the the seller's point of view. And it's the same concept in, in selling a business. We see it time and time again where the statements, the records, everything is sufficient for the business owner because the business owner knows the business. They've been doing it for 20, 25, 30 years. The statements are really just something that their banks and the CRA require them to, to have and to file. But when it comes to an M&A transaction or a, a sale transaction, as a buyer, I, I really want to know, are the numbers that I'm being presented with accurate? And there's a there's several ways that you can do this leading up to a transaction. And, and you know, even if it's a five-year timeline, 
looking at how you record data and how you ensure that your system is clean prior to any type of, of sale mandate is, is key. And a lot of that just comes down to accounting best practices. You know, I touched on the inventory piece. The inventory one is critical because I would say 95% of clients that I deal with, if I ask them to pull me an inventory report on a random day through the year, they'd have a hard time being able to produce that, both in quantity and, and dollar values. And what that does is it, it translates into what the actual income of the business could be. So if I'm going and trying to verify some of these numbers and I don't have good record keeping to go back to various points in time, whether it be monthly, quarterly, even some companies that we deal with don't do annual count, it's very hard when I'm presented with financial statements to ensure that the numbers on that paper are accurate. And I, I keep talking about inventory, but there's other aspects as well. Having a clean account receivable, you know, not having accounts receivables that have been sitting there for two, three years, cleaning that up, again, making it look tidy, ensuring that, again, a buyer coming in has that reassurance that the way the business is operating from a financial standpoint is clean and is a, you know, and again, it's an asset, the buyer is purchasing an asset and they want to purchase an asset that is, is free of liability and is going to generate them some cash in, in the future as well. So I think that the financial statements and the reporting in conjunction with the tax are two critical components that need to be considered prior to engaging anyone to assist with a, a sale mandate on a business. And up with those statements, I would assume that in those last couple of, or those years that you're prepping, let's say it's the two years you're getting ready to sell your business for businesses that are selling a product that they're, is it pretty common that they're obviously going to want to try and boost sales in those last couple of years to make these statements look better? So sales, sales will help. I think it really depends on the type of business that you're in. If you're in something that is software or, or technology related, sales are critical and probably more critical than a business that is, say, in, in the manufacturing space because of the potential to increase pricing in the future. And if you've got some piece of technology or software or an app where you can quickly flip a switch and change your pricing structure in two years, well, then having that comfortable base of subscribers is going to be very different than a consistent base of customers in a manufacturing company. So yes, sales are important, but depending on the industry, sales may be not as important as bottom line. And looking at growing sales for the sake of growing sales and, and not looking at what your profitability is can sometimes lead to reduced valuations and, and often reduced sale prices on, on businesses if the focus strays away from efficiency and optimization as opposed to just simply driving sales. Okay, great point. Now let's touch on business valuations. So I heard many years ago, the phrase when it comes to business evaluations that a lot of business owners feel that one's baby is never ugly, <laughs> meaning that owners always value their business much greater than what the market thinks. And we see this just with simple people's homes. Uh, when they go to sell them, they try justifying or they obviously it's their family home. They think it's going to be sometimes more than what they'll actually get from the market. So because of so many different types of businesses out there, I get asked this question a lot uh, where people with businesses are just really confused on what the value of their business is even worth. So where do they get a proper valuation done on their business since there are just so many different unique businesses out there? Yeah, great question, Chris. And, and this one actually, it, it comes up quite a bit because there's a, there's a misconception in the market around what value and price is during a, a sale transaction versus appraised value. And if you go back to the real estate example, I think this is a, is a perfect case. You have a lot of properties that will be valued based on the income that they produce. 
So we have a commercial property that's valued at $2 million. It has some tenants in it and it spits out a certain amount of cash every year. A land developer comes in and wants to turn that property into condos. Well, now that property on the market's worth eight, $10 million. So even though I have an appraisal in hand that's a few months old, it's almost irrelevant to what an actual transaction price would be. And the same thing is true about a business. You can quantify a business's price or value based on some predetermined criteria. And that's what a valuation does. So a valuation will help support a, a tax reorg and to come up with a value that's theoretical for various purposes. When it comes to actually selling your business, the business is worth what somebody will pay for it. And there's various ways that you can come up with that number. You don't necessarily need to engage a valuator to value your business before putting it up for sale. Will it help? Absolutely. But what we find sometimes is that if you have a valuation or somebody performs a valuation on your business, it's hard to go out to the market present that valuation and then ask for more because inherently people are stuck on quantitative facts about that entity. So what we typically do in our practice is we perform what's called a pricing study and a pricing study essentially takes out some of the criteria of an appraisal. And we say in the world today, in the environment that you're operating in, in the type of business and industry, and with the, the buyer network that we know of, let's do some math, let's layer in some qualitative factors, and let's come up with a value for your business, not based on criteria that has been predetermined by valuators, but based on what we believe a reasonable return rate would be for that buyer buying your business or that asset. And that becomes a very different calculation depending on the buyers that you're approaching. And it's the same, same concept. If I'm, buy, if I'm selling my piece of real estate to somebody that's going to lease it out and continue to generate the same amount of cash, we'd call that a financial buyer. And chances are we can come up with a very good estimate as to what your business is worth, just strictly based on some qualitative and quantitative factors. When it becomes more interesting is if we're going through a strategic sale. So same with the commercial property and the land developer. Somebody's coming in and they're going to do something a little bit different with your business. Maybe they've got a portfolio of similar businesses and they're going to, to bolt it on and create one bigger business. Maybe it's a competitor that wants to buy out a you know some competition from the marketplace. There's various factors that would provide a strategic buyer an advantage to buying your business. And all of those strategic factors would help increase the amounts that you can generate for your business. And that's where it becomes very difficult to say, let's go on and get a valuation done. And in all of the transactions that we run, we actually don't present a price or a value to the potential buyers. We let them come back and run it more as an auction. So though I get this question quite a bit, what's my business worth? How do we substantiate that number? Do I get a valuation? 99% of the time, we do a quick calculation and then allow the buyers to come up with with their figures as opposed to well here's an appraisal or evaluation this is the number that i want all right interesting so you're letting the buyers basically come back to you with a price and to see if they're even close to the ballpark that you've done after you're analyzing the business and everything else and then you kind of start from there it sounds like correct and we don't even lead the buyers in most cases we don't say We've come up with a range of four to six million or whatever the number is. We'll present all of the data to the potential group of buyers and we'll let them determine what the business is worth. And it is very much like a closed auction process where the buyers themselves don't see what the other bids are, but they do see all the financial information to be able to do that calculation on their own. And then do you have tips or is there red flags on 
when you're kind of pre-qualifying buyers so that you're not wasting time or what, how can you tell when someone, uh, someone's pretty serious that you're going to keep investing this time on them to potentially buy a business that you guys have available? Yeah. So that, that one's very, very tricky in the, in the financial buyer space. We have relationships and have dealt with almost every financial buyer that would likely be at the table in, in some shape or form. And we'll have relationships across Canada and the U S with those types of buyers. And we'll know that, look, if they're, if they're investing the time, they're spending the money and the resources. We know that once we get to a certain point with them, they're serious about pursuing the, the acquisition when it comes to a strategic or, or let's say it's a, a family run private business, buying another family run private business. That's where it becomes a little bit tricky and to determine what the interest level is when really their time and resources are their own personal sweat equity and they're not paying professionals necessarily on the other end to review information, it it becomes a little bit more difficult. And what we typically do is we ensure that before we, we open up the financial statements and the various other data that they would need to to run through the potential acquisition and and the due diligence, we go through a few steps that would give us a bit of insight as to whether or not they were interested. And and typically, you're trying to get to a signed letter of intent before you go through a lot of due diligence and, and frankly, work and fees from a seller perspective to get that idea of if they are seriously interested, but when it comes to the strategic market, it's, it's very challenging to to determine that. Yeah. Now let's, let's touch, you mentioned the family run businesses. So you and I have spoken about this before and the family run businesses, an example I heard years ago was a family donut shop across the street from a Tim Hortons in a Northern Ontario little town. And let's just call the family donut shop, Bob's donuts. And I use this example with a lot of clients where you have the two donut shops and Bob and his family are heavily involved in the donut shop. And then across the street is Tim Hortons and the owner of that isn't actually even living in Ontario. And when I use that example to my clients and say, well, Bob is in the back, he's baking donuts, he's heavily involved, he's in there every day, so is his family, his customers know him well, they ask for Bob when they come in. And then I say, are you a Tim Hortons or are you Bob? And majority of the, of my clients are like, yeah, I'm Bob and I'm heavily involved. And that can be a good and bad thing. The only thing is when you start to go down the road of potentially selling it, there's a bit of a threat with that with the new owner that if Bob and all his, his family just leave, that they may lose existing customers because they've relied so much on Bob and his family over the years. So what should steps should a business owner be doing if they are Bob and how do they slowly cut themselves out of the business and get it in a better shape in that two year mark? So the customers aren't heavily relying on just one individual in the business. Sure. And that's that, that again is a, a question that's very dependent on the type of business. If we look at professional services, well, you know, if I'm a, uh, a specialist in, in the medical field and I have a practice, it's going to be very difficult to, to hand that over to, to anybody outside of, of my trade. And even then, I may have relationships with existing clients or patients that may leave when that business is, is transitioned. So, so there's an extreme example in your example of, of a, a donut shop across from Tim Hortons really what has to happen over that period of time when they're prepping. So let's use the two year rule of thumb as they're prepping for that sale. They're also prepping for the transition of, of ownership and the prepping of it, of, of ownership is less around, well, I need to come up with somebody to do the sales and marketing other than me, somebody to do the finance and accounting other than me, somebody to do the operations generally, Finding people and and adding a professional element to the business is not the most challenging piece. The most challenging piece is waking up one day and 
going into work and doing something completely different. And that's mm-hmm. what we see as usually the sticking point in those businesses where they are the, the face of the business. It's not so much that you can't find the, the talent to help you run the business. It's the psychological factors that go along with that transition. And if I'm the guy at my business and customers call me and suppliers call me and I wake up every day loving what I do and doing that, that's the hard part to transition from. It's fairly simple and straightforward, actually, to do relationship cutovers. And I I know people will argue against that and say my business is run based on relationships, but there are thousands of businesses out there, especially in the the larger private and corporate space that do this day in, day out. And you think about a bank as an example. A bank transitions accounts every 18 to 24 months. And it, it just, it naturally happens. And do they, do they lose some clients? Absolutely. Are there relationships that are built and people follow relationships through the industry? 100%. But the banks aren't worried about losing every single client when one of their relationship managers moves to another position or, or another employer. And, and the same is true with, with any business. There's definitely the potential that You could lose customers and customers could become frustrated, but there are ways to transition those relationships. And it really comes down to that willingness of the owner to say, I want to do this. I want to make this successful as opposed to, well, it's just not going to work. And I think if you've got that buy-in and you've convinced yourself that you can make it work, then it's possible in almost every organization to do so. Now, should a business owner keep the sale quiet from customers? That, that, that one's very, very tricky. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm giving you a lot of tricky ones. <laughs> most, most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, I would recommend that that is completely confidential. Yeah. And you don't start talking about that until you are you have an imminent transaction on your hands. If you're talking about that a couple of years in advance, you you probably don't want to be disclosing that to customers. And the the reason I I say that is, again, it's around that relationship transfer. If I spend two years introducing my customers to various other people in the organization that you know are going to be there long-term, and frankly, what happens when you transition a business especially in the private spaces, most of the staff stay intact. Unless you're, you're selling to a strategic partner that really only wants to buy a few pieces of the business, in most cases, the company continues to run as, as it did with some slight changes and enhancements. The main difference is the ownership group that transitions. So if I now have some relationships built up with my sales team, with customers, well, when that day comes that I have to go and tell them that, look, we're, we're selling the business. I'm going to be around for the next year, year and a half transitioning. Oh, but by the way, you remember these other two individuals that I introduced you to, they'll be here long term. And that's a, that's a much different conversation and transition than oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell my business in two years and you'll deal with whoever comes in after me. And it's, it's the reason why certain businesses work really well with transitions. One that came up all the time with, you know, back in my commercial banking days that transitioned well were, were dentists that transitioned to their staff. So, so to a hygienist that was, was going to become a dentist. And the reason it works so well is that that relationship was built up with multiple individuals that when the time came, nothing really changed for that customer. And that's the same concept that you want to instill in your business is that think about the relationships you have with suppliers and with customers and think about how you can ensure that when the time comes that you essentially hand the keys over, that that customer is as comfortable and familiar with other members of your team as they are with you. Well, great points. No, I think thanks very much, Ryan. That makes a lot of sense. I guess the most important question too that we hadn't really touched on yet is, these business owners should be asking, why do they want to even exit in the first place? 
because we've today we've been talking about a lot of things but i guess the mental side of it too is obviously extremely important because this is their baby like a lot of these business owners they they built this from nothing so they really need to be asking why are they exiting in the first place and for listeners if you want to touch on that are you thinking of potentially exiting and just the mental aspect of selling but more even even so in retirement uh, you'll remember that Patrice and I did an episode not too long ago called Retiring Well, and it's actually part one that goes over this specifically. So I always believe it's important to be, to a degree, to always be thinking of exiting. Like, for instance, I still plan on doing my business for at least 20 years, but I do have contingencies put in place. And the reason is, obviously, it's perfect for retirees or someone selling a business that we pick a future date, a, a finish line. And that is when we retire. And that is the most perfect way to retire or sell your business. But then unfortunately, there's the five Ds I've heard with in regards to business that can pop up and completely change our plan. And that's death, disability, distress, whether it's business or personal. And then of course, like disagreement, like between partners, all of those they call the five Ds can force you to leave earlier. So obviously these are all dealt with much better if you've already started to put some of these plans and tips in place, regardless of how far you are away from retirement. And a lot of these things that Ryan's touched on. The reality here is that many business owners, they're working so hard every day in their business that they just don't carve out enough time to address these concerns. So if any listeners, you're even thinking of this, you need any help, have any questions about anything we spoke today, please let us know, uh, especially in regards to the five Ds or you want a five D checkup, we, we call it. And Ryan and myself would be more than happy to assist you with any of this. So please just let us know. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, Ryan, so much. That was fantastic. Really, really appreciate you coming on the show this morning. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. Gentlemen, that was an excellent listen for potential sellers and buyers. We'll highly recommend this. Ryan Parkinson of Grant Thornton and Chris Duro of Three Hats Financial. To make sure you know when new episodes of Chris's podcast are available, Subscribe to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth using the subscribe button on this page. You can also share with the share button. I'm Patrice Sikora, and let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. All comments are of a general nature and should not be relied upon as individual advice. The views and opinions expressed in this commentary may not necessarily reflect those of IPC Investment Corporation. While every attempt is made to ensure accuracy, facts and figures are not guaranteed. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.